Precision approaches like an ILS are great because there's very little ambiguity in when and how fast to descend and when to decide and execute a missed approach. It's all built into the vertical guidance. Non-precision approaches like a localizer or VOR approach require a little bit more strategic thinking, however. Let's look at the localizer approach to runway 3-2 in Ocean City, Maryland. The localizer approach is a non-precision approach because there's no vertical guidance. If this were an ILS, the approach would feature a glide slope to go along with the localizer. But here at Ocean City, we've just got the loc. On the profile view of the approach, we see that there's various points along the approach like Eluco and Bender with minimum altitudes. These are called step-down fixes. On this approach, we identify where these fixes are based on our DME distance from the localizer. Eluco is at 5.3 DME, for example. So when we're on the localizer at 5.3 DME, we have to remain above 1,500 feet. Since we don't have vertical guidance, we don't have anything to continuously guide us down to these altitudes. The only requirement is that we remain above those altitudes until passing the fix. In meeting these requirements, an aircraft could begin the approach at, say, 2,000 feet, reach FEMOD, begin a descent to 1,500, and level off before reaching Eluco. Descend after Eluco to 720 feet, and level off again. Pass Bender and descend to the minimum descent altitude of 340 feet. Level off, search for the runway, and then begin a descent to land once near enough to make a stable approach. A lot of times you hear this called dive and drive. Dive down to each step down altitude and then drive. Because I guess dive and fly doesn't sound as cool as dive and drive. Sounds like a holiday car slogan to me though. Let's think about all of the different steps that are involved in this example of a dive and drive approach though. We start out in level cruise settings at 2,000 feet approaching FEMOD. We reach FEMOD and reduce power for a descent. We make our descent to 1,500 feet. Once there, we increase power again to cruise to level off. We fly that level flight to Eluco. Eluco is our final approach fix as shown by the Maltese cross, so it will get configured for the final approach. This means we'll reduce power once again, add flaps as needed, extend the gear if necessary, and descend down to 720 feet. Increase power again, level off. After bender, we reduce power, descend to 340 feet, the MDA, Increase power, level off, start looking for the runway. Once it's in sight, reduce power and land. If it seems overly complicated, it's because it probably is. Remember from your private training that everything in the airplane is connected. If you change something, you need to coordinate it by changing something else. When you increase power in a single engine aircraft, the nose will rise and yaw to the left. Each change in power will have to be coordinated with rudder and elevator inputs. When you're in instrument conditions, any increase in workload can lead to distractions, which is not what we want on an instrument landing. Common accidents on these approaches result from missing the level off at the MDA and impacting terrain. Or even when leveling off at the proper MDA, starting the descent to the runway too early and having to drag the aircraft in to avoid a collision. An instrument approach should be the most plain vanilla, boring approach we do. And so getting stabilized early and staying stabilized is the real aim of these approaches. Precision approaches like an ILS make this easy with vertical guidance, but we can approximate this guidance on non-precision approaches as well. The FAA recommends and airlines and other operators require that aircraft fly a stabilized approach from the final approach fix to the threshold meaning no changes in power or configuration, even on a non-precision approach. But how is this possible without vertical guidance like a glide slope? If you look at the plate, you'll see that often the FAA publishes the descent angle from the final approach fix to the runway. Here, a 3.04 degree path from the final approach fix to the threshold will put the aircraft in a continuous position to land. We have no way of determining what our descent angle is in the cockpit though, so the FAA has a descent table in its Terminal Procedures publication. If we know the descent angle and our approximate speed, we can figure out how many feet per minute to fly the approach using our VSI. The plate for this approach has a descent angle at 3.04, so we'll reference the three degree row. For ground speed, this is where you need to know your aircraft. A Cessna 172 in a typical approach configuration 
Power 1700 RPM, flaps 10 degrees, attitude indicator one bar width below the horizon. We'll have a ground speed of around 80 knots, assuming no wind. Notice the descent rate at 400 feet per minute too. On the chart, we'll reference the 75 knot column as the closest to our desired 80. We find where they intersect and read our descent rate at 398 feet per minute, just as we saw in the cockpit just now. If we can fly this descent rate from the final approach fix down, we'll stay on that indicated 3.04 degree glide path. This technique is called a Continuous Descent Final Approach, or CDFA. Let's see how it's flown. We'll start at 2,000 feet in cruises before. Passing FEMOD will reduce power and descend down. We're not starting our continuous descent yet though. The 3.04 degree angle starts after the final approach fix, which is why its symbol is placed where it is in the profile view after the FAF. Now arriving at Aluco, the FAF will configure for the approach. Again, know your aircraft. We'll set descent power, configure with flaps and gear as needed, and establish our descent rate at 400 feet per minute. We could change this rate by adding or reducing power and controlling airspeed with pitch, just like any approach. We should gain sight of the runway slightly before the MDA and set power for landing. Now, if we follow the published descent angle, we should arrive at the MDA around this point here, the visual descent point. This is where a normal descent to land from the MDA can be made. So if we have the runway in sight at this point, we can go ahead and descend to land. If not, however, we shouldn't continue at the MDA any longer, since even if we gain sight of the runway afterwards, we won't be in a position to make a stable landing. We should go missed from here. This is one of the nice things about the continuous descent final approach. It allows us to leave the visual descent point fully configured, on speed, and ready to land. You should not have to destabilize the aircraft by making airspeed or trim adjustments when spotting the runway. As we said, airlines are especially keen on using CDFA on non-precision approaches, so Jeppesen has designed their approach plates to make it easy for those operators to use. Here's the same approach at Ocean City on the jet plate. First of all, notice that Jeppesen has made it so we don't have to look elsewhere to compute our descent rate for this approach. If we know our ground speed, we can read our required feet per minute right off the plate. For our 80 knot ground speed, we can interpolate between these two figures. Let's use the Jeppesen profile view to see how these descent angles are determined. We can draw a right triangle connecting our aircraft at the final approach fix at the minimum altitude of 1500 feet and the point where we cross the runway threshold. The height of this triangle is the difference between our starting altitude at the FAF and our threshold crossing height in MSL. The width of the triangle is the straight line distance flown between the FAF and the runway threshold. We'll need to convert nautical miles to feet to get the distance of 27,342 and a half feet. We could use a trig calculator like this online one to go from there and figure out the descent angle. It's about 3.04, just as indicated on the plate. Now, admittedly, we've gotten a little geeky about this here, and you won't have to be computing these yourself, but it's just a good way to see what factors go into these descent rates. If you had to lose the same amount of altitude in a much shorter distance, for example, the descent angle would be much higher. Notice on this approach that the 3.04 degree glide path keeps us above the step down altitude at Bender and the MDA at the visual descent point. A little further up the eastern seaboard from Ocean City is an approach where we'd need to adjust our descent angle. This is the VOR runway 6 at Toms River, New Jersey both the FAA and Jeppesen plates. First, on the FAA chart, notice where the descent angle is shown. It's inside that step-down fix palette, but there's nothing shown directly after the final approach fix of the VOR. This is done very much on purpose. It means that we shouldn't follow that 2.8 degree angle until after palette. Otherwise, we'll be below the minimum altitude of 820 feet when we pass the fix. So we need to delay our descent if we want to use a continuous descent final approach. The FAA plate doesn't help us out with this, but the Jeppesen plate indicates a spot where if we start our descent angle at, we'll be able to stay above the minimum of 820 feet at the step down fix and maintain this angle all the way down to the runway. It's another huge advantage the Jeppesen plates provide when doing CDFA, continuous descent final approach. A lot of us don't have Jeppesen subscriptions though, especially when we're in the training stage of our IFR flying. 
If you fly in a GPS approach with a WAS enabled unit though, you may still be able to get some help making a stabilized approach on a non-precision approach. On a GPS approach that only has LNAV minimums like the approach to freeway, runway 36, there is no vertical guidance. A WAS enabled GPS unit will be able to create what's called an advisory glide slope, which computes a descent angle to the runway similar to the ways we've seen already. You'd know you have this advisory guidance because the unit would display something like this, LNAV plus V at the bottom, meaning lateral navigation plus vertical. When you're flying the approach and the VOR receiver is paired to the GPS, both the horizontal and vertical needles would provide guidance. This is not the same, however, as an approach with vertical guidance like an LPV or an ILS. This vertical guidance is advisory only. It isn't part of the approved approach. You should be mindful of how closely you follow it when flying certain approaches. Here's the GPS to runway 23 in Elkins, West Virginia. Notice there's no descent angle given on the profile view here, so you'd be happy to be able to use advisory guidance like LNAV plus V here. However, following this guidance down below the MDA of 3160 feet would put us right into the top of one of these hills in this beautiful mountain state. This is why the advisory glide slope isn't an official part of the approach. You still need to stay above minimum altitudes. So that's some things to keep in mind when flying non-precision approaches. Remember that the name of the game in instrument flying is stability. And so any of these tools can be useful in making stable, safe approaches through the clouds to the runway. If this was helpful, please click subscribe so that you could stay up to date on every new training video coming out each Tuesday and Friday and get access to posts and articles that'll take your training even further. It just takes one click and it's so worth it.